Hi everyone, welcome to another Bench to Bedside episode and in the Bench to Bedside series I talk about science topics that are interesting to me and try and bring forward a bit of relevant and new science research. Um, Previously I've spoken about male contraceptives, the African Genome Project and tracing your heritage using genomics. I've also spoken about cardiovascular imaging and the use of AI within that. And today we'll be talking about sickle cell. So if you want to learn a bit more and see how new science ties into that, continue watching. Whenever sickle cells in the headlines, it tends to come about due to failings in people understanding um, how to treat patients with diseases, with the disease, and people coming forward due to the lack of proper awareness within hospital staff. And that has been brought up again recently within headlines. Um, but within those headlines, there also comes a new wave of people just remembering or um, finding out about the disease, finding about the severity, or again, just being reminded that sickle cell is a disease that affects quite a lot of people. Um, In terms of science news, sickle cell is quite an old disease. So with that being said, the new technology that is called CRISPR has kind of been a focus in applying that to sickle cell disease and sickle cell patients. So yeah, I'm just going to talk a little bit about both of them and how they relate was first mentioned in 1670 and then later again in 1870 the first African literature reported the condition. Um, In 1904 Western world finally caught up and in turn described sickle cell and in 1949 a biochemist named Linus Linus Pauling declared sickle cell anemia the first molecular disease. Sickle cell is a genetic disease inherited from parent to child and the disease causes a change in the shape of your blood. So your blood is usually quite circular and it then changes into a sickle shape, hence hence the name sickle cell disease. Um, Sickle shape causes a reduction in the amount of oxygen your blood carries and with that comes a whole range of health problems that sickle cell patients deal with. So each year affects around 300,000 people. You tend to think with a lot of diseases sometimes, why is it still a problem? I think it's always a question I try and go into. So the main treatment for sickle cell is blood transfusions. And with that comes problems. So within Western countries, there is a lack of black donors. And with that, it's just not enough people have enough potential matches to have the treatment and um, in African countries it can be that there is also a lack of awareness sometimes um, lack of just diagnostic tools to early detect this disease because the earlier the better Um, the first step with sickle cell is usually um, is usually identifying identifying the parent with the disease and then talking to them or later on you can also identify a child with sickle cell disease once they are born but it's obviously easier to know both parent status before people have a child it's much easier to identify if your child will have sickle cell um, disease Um, the earlier you also identify these children the better because you can then give them the tools necessary to adjust their lifestyles but unfortunately 50 to 90 percent of children die before they're five years old but um Quite a few people do live to, live to adulthood. And again, as mentioned, there are societies that support patients with sickle cell disease, try and champion and advocate for them. And in the UK, I'm going to mention them a lot, but Sickle Cell Society UK is amazing. And I watched a video recently where they shared the story of a woman called Bola. Bola has sickle cell disease and she is living with her partner. She's married with kids. And I think the most striking thing in the video, I encourage everybody to go and watch it. The most striking thing about the video was understanding or just seeing how her partner at first um, was quite open to just hearing that she had sickle cell, but he also didn't properly understand what comes with it. But I guess with living with her, he learned a lot more about the disease, which just goes um, goes to show how little people really know about sickle cell unless you know somebody affected. 
And then um, in that film also, it highlights the importance of blood transfusions. Um, Bola shares a story, there's a clip where she goes to hospital and then as a result of her treatment, she has been able to visit the hospital less, which is huge for um, sickle cell patients. Moving on into how does this relate to the CRISPR technology? So CRISPR is this new shiny toy and sickle cell is a very old disease. So it is one of the first um, targets for application of this technology. In simple terms, it is a gene editing tool. So you can basically copy and paste um, genes. So remove a faulty gene and put in the gene that you want. So um, for sickle cell, there has been this study that has been done in a um, a small group of patients that are severely affected by sickle cell disease. And when I say severely, their hospital visit uh, visitations can be up to about seven per year um, with quite um, serious complications, which is a lot. That's like every other month and then some. In this study, um, firstly, I want to point out that they, um, they were able to find out that patients that had higher levels of fetal um, hemoglobin had... Um, were less likely to die from their crisis or die from the disease. So have this in your head. Um, <laughs> so patients with higher levels of fetal hemoglobin had less chances of dying. So with the CRISPR technology, there, as human beings and as we develop and as we grow, you have certain genes that are turned on and certain genes that are turned off. So as you grow from baby to adult, these things will change. And so they wanted to target the gene that causes the fetal hemoglobin to turn off. So they wanted it to stay on. That was the main purpose of using this CRISPR tool. They wanted the um, gene that turned off um, fetal hemoglobin production to be switched on and stay on in these patients. So at the beginning of the study, about 70, um, about 75, let's say using a patient, 75% of their blood was had sickle hemoglobin. 75% of their blood had sickle hemoglobin. And um, after treatment, they were able to increase um, the, decrease the sickle hemoglobin and increase the fetal hemoglobin. So it went from 75% sickle um, hemoglobin to 43% sickle he hemoglobin with 52% fetal hemoglobin. And in this group of patients, um, as much as the, the good thing about this therapy is that in this group of patients they had less hospital visits and for cases where the disease is so severe and there are little to no options that is like an amazing breakthrough um to further that um another paper i read just puts into context the reality of the finding and that not all um not all patients will receive this therapy because it is um it is limited to people that suffer the most from it and to see the widespread use of CRISPR and gene editing in the future will be limited until like a lot of things are like smoothed over and people kind of know what they're doing. It's a bit of like another topic, um, the drama of CRISPR and is it really that cool tool, you know? And finally, finally, to end this video, I think I started thinking about what determines what is funded and why aren't things funded because sickle cell is the oldest the first molecular disease described um ever and with why hasn't there been more money going into it and we know a lot a lot of people are affected by sickle cell disease um to kind of put this into context research funding is either funded by government institutions or privately funded and a really um good example is using cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a disease that is a genetic disease um, that is also called, caused by a mutation. And that disease causes the buildup of mucus within tissues with mucal linings. So cause the buildup of mucus basically. And um, 
that disease mainly affects Caucasians. And using the US as an example, one in 2,500 um, people are born with cystic fibrosis, but one in 365 people are born with sickle cell disease. But cystic fibrosis re receives about three times the funding. And the gaps here, when you look into a little bit, have to do with also just private donations into um, cystic fibros um, fibrosis charities, cystic fibrosis work, and also maybe cystic fibrosis awareness. Also, if you in the western world a disease that mainly affects people of the west is going to be researched a lot more and i guess that is a sad thing when it comes to diseases that affect black people and africans because africa as a whole that could be leading this do not have the resources sometimes to fund research into these things but again there are places that are doing the work slowly but with more awareness hopefully there there are more donations into sickle cell research more people genuinely aware of sickle cell and just bettering the lives of patients that are already born with sickle cell and easing their day-to-day -day struggles and finally um this could get you thinking of possibly donating blood if that's something you feel comfortable to do and just doing a little bit more research for yourself and passing it on to like friends and family members but that's it from me and if you enjoyed it and if you learned something please share it to somebody else and keep the conversation going because we need more research and funding and awareness into sickle cell disease